Yale Singer Cell Omics. Thanks very much, Lior. Thanks, Sandrine. Um, thank you, everyone. It's super emotional to be here um, and so many amazing people and um, in such a great meeting, uh, literally waiting two years for this moment. So thank you, uh, Sandrine, and thank you, Roderick, and, and Stephen, and, um, and everyone else who helped organize the meeting. So um, I have, uh, I'm the last person today, and I'll try to be on time. I have 30 slides in three parts. So, uh, and my main point will come in, part, in slide 24. So, um, and I, I'm gonna, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to be on the theme of the, of the meeting and talk about like what we can learn from very large data. And in particular, I wanna talk about one thing I learned and it, it's a simple thing, but it's, it's a basic thing. And it's, it has to do with really the topic that, that's been recurring today, which is um, you know, single cell data and specifically how to normalize data and why we use the negative binomial distribution. That's really what I wanna talk about. So I was motivated actually by two papers that uh, you know, uh, were finished in some form during COVID, but my lab had been working on for about four years, or the last four years. Um, and one of them was um, a paper on um, isoform cell type specificity in the mouse primary motor cortex, very related to what we heard about in the first talk this morning. Um, uh, this was an analysis performed primarily by my student, Sina, who is Hagi as part of a large uh, consortium to study the mouse brain. And we, we, this was a part we did. Uh, there was another project in my lab, which had to do with, uh, of all things, you know, sequencing a single cell atlas of the jellyfish. And I'm not gonna tell you much about these projects, just two slides on each, but they motivated lots of questions uh, that have then become the, the, the computational focus of my lab and, and really something we've devoted several years to now. So let me just say briefly about this project and what questions it motivated. So. This was, I think, fair to say, the first very large scale uh, detailed isoform level atlas. We first put it out in 2020. And um, we analyzed, I think, around 38 billion reads for this is large scale, fair to say, I think. Um, and what we did in this paper is we, we looked at spatial data from a technology called MRFISH, SmartSeq data, along with 10x data, which are different kinds of single cell RNA-seq data. They all measure transcription. So they're not really modalities like Elizabeth just talked about because they're all about just RNA. Um, and we didn't integrate these data. We, we, our point of our paper is how we use the data sets vis-a-vis -vis each other in conjunction to try to assess, you know, what isoforms are active in which cell types. And, and we, we developed an atlas like this. Um, I won't say more about it today, but we had for you know, the cell types that were annotated in, in this region of the brain, a very detailed resolution of which isoforms are present in one cell type and not another or in the combinations of cell types. And what we did in this paper primarily, we searched for examples where at the gene level, there's no real effect you see between cell types, but there's isoform switches underneath the hood. And we even identified cell types that you might miss where you did just look at a gene level analysis. You know, in the sort of smoothie or Lego analogy, we saw a great one earlier today of why you might do single cell. Well, th this is why you might do isoform analysis. So there's a lot of action under the hood. But in order to do all of this, we needed to do what many people do nowadays with single cell, which is normalize the data, dimensionally reduce it, all that sort of thing. And we, this was complicated because we had different data types. And so question number one was, you know, which data set should we use? How would we combine them? And we didn't really know. So that led to lots of questions. And I'll just say that there's a whole issue of nature. Um, this was part of a project called the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. And I think Sandrine and several others in this room worked on it as well. Um, there's lots of papers in this issue. All of them faced similar challenges and performed what you might think was fairly standard analysis and made figures like this uh, that many of you have seen already, both today and in other talks. Um, I should say after working on this for a few years, we were uncomfortable based on really digging into our own little corner of this project with like how all these steps are working. The same kind of feeling came about in this jellyfish project. I won't say why or how, but I collaborated with two great groups, the Anderson Lab at uh, Caltech and the Holliston Lab in France. And for various reasons, my lab, you know, sequenced the first jellyfish atlas. Uh, but an interesting thing is we did actually an experiment and about four years ago, 
there were not actually many experiments with single cell rna seq. You had people like sequencing a tissue, but not really looking at different conditions and performing replicate experiments in each condition. But we did that in this experiment. We had five jellyfish that were starved and five that were healthy. This is a jellyfish that at the time, almost nothing was known about it. It had a very a sort of genome sequence, but nobody knows what the genes are. And so our goal was to see which genes are different in starved and fed animals and to figure out at a single cell level what all the cell types are in this jellyfish. There was not even another single cell jellyfish out there. So for this project, uh, you know, we did that kind of thing and we had like a picture of this is an animal. We managed to tether the cell types to parts of the animal by doing in situs. And it was a lot of work. Um, there's four co-first authors. Uh, Tara was my student at the time, as well as Jace uh, Gehring, uh, who's now across the street at Arcadia Biosciences. Um, but I learned a lot as a more computational biologist about how hard it is to really know for sure that something is maybe a cell type. And one of the interesting things here, because we had five replicates in the fed and starved animals, um, we could ask questions about what's the difference between a state versus a type of cell. And, um, and we have figures and analysis about that. And I don't wanna get into that except to say that these are questions that emerge from these two projects. Um, you know, first of all, as a first step, you got all this count data, how do you normalize it? And we had a great talk, a great talk by, by Davida earlier about exactly this kind of question. Um, it's very complicated when you have replicates of jellyfish that are starved and fed, like do you combine them all together to normalize the data? Or do you do them one at a time? A simple question. Which normalization procedure do you use? Same with the single cell isoform stuff. Do you do the smart sick technology separately from the 10X? Yeah, maybe the technology looks different. We had a lot of debates about that. Similarly, we realized that we were very confused about dimension reduction procedures. Like the reason people care about the, the you know, normalizing their data is because for steps like PCA, you don't wanna have a lot more variance in your highly expressed genes because then your whole PCA is just dominated by them. And so, um, so it's one thing as you know, a statistician to think about these questions. It's another thing to implement them as a computer scientist in 38 billion reads. And it's a third thing as a biologist to really care about the answer. Um, and I, I learned all those lessons the hard way uh, in these projects. Well, there are other questions as well about how to use the replicates and how to elucidate differentiation trajectories. And these are interesting questions. And for each of them, we had a sort of sub question that made us uncomfortable. Should you even normalize data? Why are we actually applying dimension reduction and is it really necessary? Um, how should experiment, you know, replicates be actually collected? All these things. So I won't talk about all this today. Um, I thought actually a long time about what, you know, what to talk about here. And, and I apologize, Roderick, for my late um, abstract submission. But part of the reason was I wanted to, you know, I, I really debated which of us to talk about today. And I thought the second one would be interesting, but I'm going to talk about the first thing. Okay? So that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm ready to go into part two and talk about exploratory data analysis very briefly. I think it's interesting, you know, I learned, and I wasn't trained in statistics at all. I'm not a statistician, I, I sort of studied math. But coming to Berkeley, uh, you know, many years ago as a, a postdoc first, uh, was really transformative for me because Berkeley has a stats department, which many schools don't have. And here I learned, one well, of the first things I learned from friends and colleagues here, some of them here today, is about exploratory data analysis. And there's a great book about it by John Tukey. And, um, you know, the, the, this, I might think it's fair to say that the Berkeley statistics tradition, uh, which is not the same as all the other statistics traditions, involves really look, doing exploratory data analysis before you really start to like understand your data. And I learned that from the statisticians here. Um, but the interesting thing is that exploratory data analysis is not really about, you know, just making plots with your data. It's I think how some people use it today, but it's about really, and this is, you know, the way Tukey thought about it was, the purpose of it is in part to assess your assumptions and to select your appropriate tools. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and this was another point Tukey made is, you know, not to generate and test hypotheses on the same data. And we heard this word double dipping today many times. It's a very interesting issue. Uh, it's kind of that issue. Um, so the, 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 the plot I learned, like I literally learned this in 2001, the first thing you do with your data is you make mean variance plots and I was happy to see some of them today. And this is from a paper that I even think was referenced earlier by David, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's uh, from Wolfgang Huber and uh, Alman Etze. And they looked at, you know, different 
data sets, um, we might focus on the bottom row here. These are cell lines. Um, and if you look at single cell RNA-seq data, but it's also true for bulk RNA-seq, it's true for most count data, actually. Um, you know, by, there's randomness in the sampling, and that leads to uh, a Poisson relationship, it's called, because the Poisson is a good approximation to the multinomial distribution. And so you kind of expect to see this line y equals x, but real data sets are sort of over dispersed or um, uh, super linear. And typically what's done is a quadratic is fit to them uh, because that is uh, the variance relationship you expect from a negative binomial. So this is something that everybody does in single cell RNA-seq is sort of understand this fact. And in the negative binomial distribution, which I won't say much about, but it has the property that its variance um, is quadratic in the mean. And so you can estimate this parameter phi, which is how much over dispersion you have. And why do people do this? Because if you don't worry about this issue and you just stick your data like into some procedure like PCA, which is what a lot of people do, then right, if you, if you, the genes that are very uh, you know, highly expressed, they're gonna dominate the whole analysis basically, right? So, so that's why, and, and there's a procedure called variance stabilization, it's classic. His goal is to remove this relationship. And that's what I want to talk about briefly. So one thing I'll say, and it's important, is that the negative binomial actually makes sense mechanistically from a statistical point of view, because while the Poisson arises from random sampling, you know, you reach into the jar and you pull out different RNAs. Um, if you assume that the rate parameter of the Poisson is gamma distributed, and you're really looking at a mixture of Poissons, then you get the, that's one way to understand what the negative binomial distribution is. So there's some combinatorial interpretations, but this one is statistically relevant in this example because you might think, okay, you know, it, maybe different cell types have a slightly different sampling rate or genes of different type. That rate variation in the Poisson is what leads to the overdispersion. And I think what's people, that's what people imagine. And, uh, and you know, uh, we even heard it today several times. There's the technical variation that people usually think about the actual sampling. Sometimes people talk about biological variation is what you might see in different replicates, biological replicates, that's, you know, sort of the excess stuff. All right, I just wanna say one last thing about the classical statistics and then I'll move on, is that there's a literature on this one, it's 1930s actually, but in 1948, Anscombe wrote a sort of important paper on this, and he showed that using this thing called the Delta method, which is basically Taylor series expansion, you can derive the transformation of your data that stabilizes the variance that makes it so that the highly expressed genes have similar variance to the lower expressed genes. And this is, you know, this transformation has some nice properties. Like, I mean, you could just set all the variances equal, all right? Um, that, that's simple, but this transformation is monotonic and has some nice properties and that's why people use it. And in particular, an approximation to the sort of thing you get out these days, you can get this in one line in Mathematica, is the log transform. And that's why people log their data, right? Because it is actually the right transformation for negatively binomial distributed data. But one, in, one insight that comes from reading Anscombe in 1948 is that the pseudo count, which usually is set to one, because that's what's implemented in Python and R in most packages, corresponds to a, an assumption about the over dispersion. Actually, the more or less over dispersed your data is, you would actually change the pseudo count. And if you really want to actually test log on your data, you should actually learn that, you know, you should make this plot. Um, uh, sorry, uh, I should say, yeah, you should make one of these plots and fit the quadratic and actually put the right thing in. At, at least one should do that. Most people don't do that. But it turns out that one, it's, pretty close to what most data looks like, although there's high variability. Anyway, that's sort of uh, most of my part two. That's why people log transform their data, all right? So we really like started to look at this, you know, I said we had some anxieties over the analysis we were doing. And one of the things we did is we reverse engineered Surat because this is a program that almost everybody uses for their data. In fact, today, I think there were several Surat images. It turns out that, you know, Log is not actually what people mostly do in their analysis. Sometimes it is. I'm not going to go through detail in this thing, but there's a Surat object 
if you just want to like we just want to understand like what happens when you run the standard software on your data and it's not documented exactly anywhere so we read the source code and in the Surat object there's three so-called slots like the program holds three matrices in memory at once and there's different procedures you can apply to these slots like they can be the raw counts you can put in the scale dot data can be the log data or it can be some other transformation there's several options one of the recommended ones by the authors of Surat is a thing called SC transform which is some method to compute Pearson residuals and then you know these different slots get used in different functions I don't know if you can read this but typically people do PCA and that uses one slot and then you have different slots being used when you do differential analysis and it's it's very very complicated all right so uh, the main point was that we started to wonder whether we knew anything really about what transformation is the right one or anybody had assessed it so we decided to look at it and we wrote a preprint it just came out early this year um, so first thing I'll say now I'll get on to part three we looked at you know how I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word well, but how effectively these methods, how effective the methods are at actually stabilizing the variance. There's another issue, which is different cells are sequenced to different depth. And we looked at, you know, whether the depth is being, you know, made uniform, uh, because that's one of the goals of these methods. And um, we also looked at whether the transformations were monotonic or not, because that is implicitly assumed in some downstream analyses. And we ended, we ended up, so this is just one data set. It's the cell line I showed you earlier. We looked at nine methods, just the raw counts. This is just the normalization of the depth alone. This is the log transformation. What's often done is a combination of those. First, you normalize the depth and then you log the data. That's very standard in almost all workflows. Uh, this is the SC transform. This is another common option. Um, so I, I don't have time to go through all of it. But one thing I wanted to say is that Getting this done in 520 data sets was both very difficult and very informative. Usually people look at one or two data sets, maybe three. Um, there's a wide, this is just to show you on these three measures, whatever they are, there's like a very wide range for a given method on how effective it is, for example, in the top one, it's stabilizing the variance. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so we saw that, you know, this is very, very data set specific on what method you should use. And, uh, and we, we learned a lot from this and it's in our preprint and I won't say more about it now. I do wanna say that in order to do this analysis of just looking at these data sets and seeing even just what the normalizations do required us to have access to lots of data. And we went looking for it in various human cell atlases and we couldn't get the, we needed the raw data because we wanted to normalize all the counts themselves. And this is a very nice paper from last year. It's by several authors, Michael Hoffman, um, I think Stephanie Hicks was mentioned earlier as an author here, where they set out like, you know, reproducibility standards. They gave bronze, silver, and gold. That's their like metric. And so assessing these various atlases by these metrics, as you can see, you sort of have silver and bronze, but it, we couldn't find anywhere with all the data, all the methods and made it easy. So. I want to talk about it today uh, because I'm on to ready to, for part three, but we created a cell atlas framework that is reproducible and, and these 526 data sets, which we, you can, uh, we have not published this yet, but we will soon allow anyone to benchmark any of the methods that they have or like um, in a uniform way on uniform process data that we didn't generate, but that we have cohesively reanalyzed uh, via a very, complicated framework that was developed by my student uh, Angel Galvez Mershon and Sina Buesagi, um, which is sort of a living atlas. Um, you can insert new data sets. We have an automated GitHub processing framework where data comes in, it gets processed automatically, it gets added to our atlas. Um, anyway, it's what allowed us to do this. All right, so with that in hand, having looked at all these normalization methods, having all this data in our hands, we finally asked the question, okay, so what should we actually do with our data? And I think there was a cool slide showing there's a thousand uh, tools out now for single cell. There's among those, there's probably a few dozen normalization tools. Um, we wondered like, does log suffice? And if not log, like what should we use, actually use? Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this. And one of the insights that came from another student of mine, Gennady Gorin, um, 
is that actually the, maybe there's some, something missed by many people, which is that the negative binomial is sort of in and of itself uh, sort of interesting to think about. Uh, and as a first point, like well, why do we normalize at all? Um, and his insight was the following. So on the right-hand side here, I've sort of summarized in one sentence what the current mindset is in genomics about single cell, and for that matter, most count data, is that there's technical variation and maybe some excess variation due to technology or maybe you know biology somehow, but that the data is, ends up being negative binomial and you should basically model this distribution or even zero inflated or something a little bit even tweaked so that you don't have these effects between mean and variance. There's an entirely different literature, which is quite foreign in genomics, not entirely, but mostly, which comes from physics, which has to do with modeling transcription mechanistically. And it turns out, I'll show you very briefly, that the current popular model in that field yields, yields a negative binomial distribution on the counts purely from biological mechanistic considerations without any regard to the actual sampling that happens in the actual experiments we do with all the cDNAs and UMIs you've heard about and all that. Well, so, so that's sort of interesting. And the question is, well, why is that and what to do about it? I can tell you just in two slides where this comes from. So in biology, starting in the 1950s with Monod and Jacob and others, people started to write down, you know, chemical reaction network models for transcription. And they had very simple ordinary differential equations like this where the rate of transcription is some constant with some degradation. And these models, I point out in this uh, footnote here, I sort of persisted actually for, you know, 50 years because, 60 years, because at that time, it was very difficult to measure anything. You know, you didn't have single cell any seq right? So you had like, so an idea about, uh, you know, this is a very, 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 very basic model for transcription. But this model is, first of all, continuous, you know, you know molecules are discrete. And we know that there actually might be very few molecules of some gene in a cell. More importantly, there's no stochasticity in, the, in, in this kind of model. Uh, you know, you can solve for the model, but there's no idea of stochasticity in the transcription or in the splicing. You know, people later extended this to include splicing. You know, you can make, instead of, you know, you start with, from your DNA making unspliced RNA, and then you have another, you know, uh, differential equation that's coupled to this one where the transcripts get spliced and then those make protein, but, but even so, there's no stochasticity. And so to ameliorate that issue, and this is about 20 years old work, not, not for me, um, but, but it's sort of classic now in, in systems biology is what's called a chemical master equation. Or, and, and this model is very simple, actually. It looks like this, and I've shown the most simple instantiation of it, where you have generation of molecules by some rate K and degradation by rate lambda, but this is now a discrete model. Imagine sort of a rope with knots and time is continuous. And at every instant, you either hop up and make a new molecule or you lose a molecule. Okay, so this is, so, and, and the rate at which you hop up or down that there's, there's some you know, Poisson process with, with the rate for transcription and degradation. And that model, if you just work it out, you, you can solve it and it's steady state distribution is the Poisson distribution, all right? So if you believe that there's stochasticity in when molecules actually get transcribed, you end up with the Poisson distribution. Um, most of these kind of models that would be relevant for biology where you have splicing and proteins and whatnot are not tractable in this way. They end up with, you know, these complicated generating functions you have to solve, but people simulate these things with something called the Gillespie algorithm, which is very classic. So the model that's favored right now is called the telegraph model or the bursty transcription model. In this model, it's the same as what I showed before. You have, you know, uh, you, 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 know you have some rate at, for each gene I, it's different for each gene at which you generate you know, molecules and then they degrade, except that you have this telegraph part where you're either on or off. Imagine, I mean, this comes from the idea of transcription factors are necessary to initiate transcription. So, you know, you have, if the transcription factor is sitting there, okay, you can start generating molecules, but if it goes off, you don't make anything. And now there's a new parameter, which is, or, you know, the, the rate or two parameters, the rate at which you switch off and switch on. 
This model is obviously too simplistic. You need to model splicing. There's lots of other stuff. Degradation rates are going to depend on the gene. Maybe your genes interact. But this is the zeroth order model in the field. And the nice thing about this particular model is two things. First, it, has, it, it didn't just come about from thought experiments. It came about from fish experiments, from fluorescent and pseudo-urbanization, where you can do one single gene in a cell. So a you know, single cell, but not in the genomic sense. And that's what the data actually looked like. And then the second thing is in this particular model, you can also actually solve for the steady state distribution. And it's, it's a long calculation. I won't bore you with it. Um, and you get out the negative binomial in the, in the limit. And it's really interesting. Uh, you know, so here, you know, you, you, you sort of don't, try, you, if you're in the off state, nothing happens. When you go on, you make a bunch of stuff. Then you're off again, then you're on. And so it, it, it's called the burst deep transcription model. And I won't, I won't bore you with like all the details of the derivation, nor, and it's very interesting actually to look at all the limiting cases of this, but you get out the negative binomial very naturally from purely mechanistic considerations. So there's actually an interesting thing going on here, which is that in systems biology, people have shown, if you take a class in that at Caltech, for example, it's taught by my physics colleagues, um, Rob Phillips and Michael Elowitz, they explain that, you know, always you'll get negative binomial count distributions. If you go to genomics conference or take a genomics class, you're taught that the data is negative binomial and the log transform is the right one to normalize the data. So here you have everyone trying to remove the noise, but the noise maybe is the biology. And by that, I mean the mechanistic biology. So it seems that there's a sort of problem here, right? Like what should you actually be doing? And are you maybe throwing you know, the biology out with the noise? So, the last slide I'll show, and I think I'm, I have three or four minutes, and it'll take a little moment to explain, is from another preprint by Gennady on a method we call Mano, uh, named after um, Manod. Um, and so we actually have implemented a model, uh, the mechanistic model, the telegraph bursty model, and actually several others that include sampling rates from the cDNAs, the, the, that is the Poisson noise that you usually see but where we can tell apart what's biological, in a sense, mechanistic, biological, and technical. And that's what's shown on the y-axis here, um, where this is our fraction of biological variance. We compared that to, this is the log with depth normalization, but we've done many others as well. Where here on the y-axis, you look at how, what's the fraction of biological variance uh, given by the normalization. Now, how can you do that? Well, when you normalize your data with, one of the standard methods, you know, you decrease the variance, but the variance doesn't all become equal. And so you can ask how much variance was left on the table. And you can say, okay, that amount, that's what's the biology, right? So that's about, and that's how we did this calculation here. Now for the x-axis, we have a lower band we computed. We don't, we, it's very hard for us to know in real, in reality, what's biological and what's technical, but we could compute a lower band. And the way we did that is we took data where there are different cell types. And we averaged gene expression across all the cells in one cell type. So now we actually have a very good estimate of the expression there because we have many, many cells per cell type and because they're assayed in one experiment. So there are no artifacts between data sets. And we look at the variance of the gene between cell types, which we assume at that point is not due to sampling because we've done so much averaging, but is due to actual biology. And what you can see here is that with standard normalizations, and this is true not just for log with depth normalization, but for every method we've tried, there is a massive underprediction of the actual amount of biology that's in the data, because basically you've assumed that all the variance you're seeing is, should be removed, by, and then you're stabilizing the variance. It's almost a topology. In our method, we are essentially reducing much less variability. Um, Maybe not enough, but we don't know. So that's, we're not done, but that's, that's where we stand now. And I should say that, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, I haven't explained exactly how this model works and how we got these estimates, but that it actually is very interesting and it requires using spliced and unspliced data and, 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 and uh, it requires quite a lot of work, which I don't have time to talk about today. So to summarize, to my last slide, I think mechanistic models of transcription are helpful and possibly necessary, 
for actually distinguishing the biological from technical variants in single cell RNA seq. It's very doable. Um, it turns out that the data you need to do this is from what are called spliced and unspliced matrices. These were first considered in the context of RNA velocity, which is an interesting technique that people use. Um, in fact, I'm trying to understand RNA velocity led us also in part to the development of Mono. I'll just point you to a preprint we've written. It's a long preprint, but it, it analyzes the foundations of this RNA velocity. It's interesting because this framework in which you get arrows on your cells and try to figure out where they're going is somehow like intrinsically requires a mechanistic model. Uh, you're trying to say, you know, this cell is changing into that cell. It's the same with pseudo time, if you know, you know some, I'm not going to talk about it, but when you try to order cells and say they're differentiating along this trajectory, you're making mechanistic claims. And so you cannot escape the mechanism in this context. Um, you know, you don't need mechanism necessarily if you're just going to like build an atlas, although I think you do. But for these time applications where you sort cells or try to figure out the velocity, you just can't escape it. And so, so that's what we wrote about there. Um, this framework we built, which we should be able to preprint, I think, in a month or two. Um, hopefully, you'll find it useful if you're working in single cell RNA seq because we have a very uniformly processed data set, um, which can be reprocessed by you and for free. And so it's completely accessible with all the reads available and so forth and so on. Um, and I'll just end with this point. I didn't get to talking about UMAPs today, uh, but I've written a little bit about them recently. And I think that's an interesting thing to talk about. And I think that there's a lot of interesting discussion to be had and work to be done in general about exploratory data analysis in this domain, uh, not just uh, for the application of normalization. So I'll end with that. And thanks again to everybody. Thank you. So we only have time for one question before the break. Very nice talk, Leo. I just have a question regarding this last part, the estimation of biological variants. So does this Goring paper provide a package for estimating biological variants from data? Yes, it does. Um, there's a package called Mono. It's written in Python and it, uh, yes, it will, utilize the spliced and unspliced matrices in order to estimate uh, these parameters, not just the technical variance, but also the degradation. I mean, you have, there's three free parameters, it turns out you can estimate. Um, just two things I'll say about it is that these are not cell specific estimates. In order to get these estimates, we have to look at many cells. I see. And um, the second is, is that it's quite computationally intensive actually process. Uh, but yes, uh, it's developed for, Mm -hmm. for use as a general Python package. I see. Does it work for 10x data as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. And again, it doesn't work for every gene also because you mm -hmm. need spliced and unspliced reads, but it was developed precisely for 10x data, which facilitates getting the unspliced reads by virtue of having, you know, the, you know, so 10x has these poly T captures. They're supposed to capture the polyadenylated transcripts, but they end up also capturing mm -hmm. unspliced reads that happen to have poly A tracks. And that's why we can do this. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.